Welcome to Ball and Play, presented by Baseball News Club. We cover everything with a ball and stick around the world. We cover Major League Baseball, to international, Dominican, Australian, to Korean. We also cover NCAA Baseball Division I and softball, all the way on down, Little League softball, to T-ball. We cover over the line, wiffle ball, anything with a ball and stick. We will cover it here at Ball and Play. Please stop right now. I need you to subscribe. Please comment and also turn on your notifications. Thank you very much. And let's get started with this journey we call baseball. Right, welcome to Ball and Play, episode number five. This is Sesame, your host. Thank you very much for listening. Today's an action-packed episode, number five. Um, this is sponsored by Baseball News Club. You can find us on Instagram, Baseball News Club, and Ball and Play on Instagram. But mainly, we're on YouTube as Ball and Play. So please go check us out, subscribe, tell your friends, and mainly follow follow us on Instagram. We post stories every day. But we just want to thank all of our listeners out there and our continued fans who download. Um, Pandora, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Mobile Safari. Looks like you guys are hitting up on the downloads with us lately. We appreciate that. We got people in Australia and the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for listening to us abroad. Again, welcome to Ball and Play. We got a lot on the docket today, guys. Uh, we've got CBA, of course, Wiffle Ball, Blitz Ball, Caribbean C Series. Yes, sirs. Caribbean Series is here. We're going to talk fantasy talk. Uh, when players leave and what happens to teams. That's an topic we're going to talk about we're also going to talk about hall of fame with big poppy that is big time news right now we're going to talk about the collective bargain agreement adam wainwright brian acuna yeah ronald's little brother uh mike schlip yep he's back in the news uh daniel ponce de leon brock holt and a lot more so let's get this ball rolling and let's talk some baseball guys now uh i'm going to first start off talk about wiffle ball and blitz ball leagues I'm very stoked to still see a lot of those going on here in the off season. I know it's January. I know we've got the lockout, but hey, you got to play all year long. That's why I tell you guys about Lightum, the Dominican, uh, the Caribbean series is going on this week. Uh, but I see a lot of whiff ball and blitz ball going on. It's very exciting to watch. Uh, the only thing I'm disappointed with blitz ball is I'm not seeing leagues. I'm not seeing teams. Uh, wiffle ball is definitely much more organized than blitz ball. I feel like blitz ball right now is just a trendy. Uh, which is good. It's trending, but I feel like it's just friends thrown to each other randomly wherever they want to throw it. Uh, you can throw it faster and further out from a wiffle ball, but I just want to see leagues. Um, is it just throwing a ball or is it actual? Can you play a game with it? So um, I did see like one league, but it didn't look like it was really organized. So again, I just try to encourage you blitz ball guys out there. Let's get the leagues going, man. And uh, speaking of Caribbean series, Let's talk about Lightum. Yeah, you guys should know about this right now. So the Caribbean series has started. Uh, it's going to finish this week in the Dominican Republic it, with six countries playing for the title. Uh, basically, four will remain after today. Uh, Venezuela, Colombia, Dominican Republic, uh, why Mexico and Panama are squaring off uh, by round winners today. Puerto Rico, uh, I think, has been eliminated. But now this is the 64th edition of the tournament. And again, guys, I'm trying to bring you guys baseball. There's plenty of baseball being played, and you could watch this at MLB if you have the, the Lightum package, which is only like 24 or 25 bucks. So, hey, man, there's more news and more baseball out there for you guys to watch. So no excuses, guys, no excuses. And then uh, let's move into some other talk. Uh, I do want to talk. Let's just talk the CBA early. Uh, we've been talking about how the CBA has been moving along well. There hasn't been any really, I guess you can say, lightning strikes or like big red flags or anything like that until Monday. Uh, Monday, I didn't like it because the owners for the first time are making threats. So everything's been kind of cooking along. We talked last week how the expanded playoffs they're not talking about anymore. Uh, they're not talking about the DH. They're You know, it's obviously revenue sharing when it comes to players want a little bit more action and wiggle womb on the free agency. The owners don't want to give that to them. Uh, obviously luxury tax, but... The problem is, is for the first time, and I've been telling you guys all along that, you know, 
when it comes to lockouts, there's never been a regular season game missed ever. But hey, you know, hey, records are meant to be broke, right? Isn't that why we've got... Now, nah, we'll talk Hall of Fame talk later. I was going to start talking McGuire and Sosa but and Roger Maris. But the, the point is, is for the first time, the owners came out and said they have threatened they would be willing to cancel games during the 2022 seasons if the MLBPA is unwilling to drop more of their demands. So, in a meeting with the Players Association on Monday, Major League Baseball Deputy Commissioner Dan Halem. <laughs> How close is that to Van Halen? Deputy Commissioner Dan Halem. Uh, said that MLB is willing to lose games over some of the outstanding issues the sites have. People with knowledge of the talk said. So, that's not good. This is the first time it's been brought up. This could be posturing. You know, the owners could be saying, hey, screw it. We're not going to play this game with you guys and go back and forth. We told you our position. You know, we're making concessions. But, you know, maybe enough is enough. Maybe the players... And, you know, I have to play devil's advocate on this because owners... They're owning a business. Players, I'm a more of a player mentality, obviously. But, you know, it's not always one way. The players could be in the position where they're like, hey, you know, maybe we're asking for too much and now the owners are pushing back. I don't know. It's hard to tell. But the fact that they're still talking and they're going to talk today, Tuesday. Um, today's Tuesday, the February 1st. Uh, they're supposed to be talking more today. So that's a positive sign. Um, but, again, it's, it's always down to money. But the fact that the owners are saying this has got me a little worried. But I have confidence. I have confidence we'll get baseball soon in the next couple weeks. I don't think we're going to... If anything's going to happen, it's going to happen towards the end of February. I think they're going to want to play around with spring training a little bit. And not allow spring training to happen on time. So pitchers and catchers might not be reporting in the middle of the month, etc. Might not have our games at the beginning of spring training. Because I, I, I it's hard to tell where they're at at this point. Um, can they wrap it up this week? My understanding, according to sources, is that it's going to take them the rest of the month to get this finished. And then there's just going to be that total rush of salary arbitration and free agency and team shuffling. So all those people I've been joking about with the last couple podcasts about making predictions for the World Series, it's stupid at this point because I'm not going to make my predictions until these free agency is over and we start the season. Uh, obviously, there's going to be free agency going on during the season, but the bulk of players, I mean, dude, we got Kershaw out there. Clayton Kershaw, you know, we talked about him recently going to a game in Dallas. Uh, that's where he lives. He's got two homes, and now there's all this, you know, rumor mill that he's going to go to the Rangers. Hey, man, it would be a logical change. You know, uh, the Rangers are really putting money into, I mean, brand new stadium a few years ago. They've always been a successful club for quite a long time, and if anything, last year was one of their worst seasons. So it's onward and upwards for Texas. Who knows? Keep an eye on that, but let's move on to other news. Brian Acuna, yeah, Ronald's little brother, 16-year-old, signed with Minnesota, 650000 Uh Scary part, his swing looks just like his big bro. But, yeah, Brian Acuna in the news. Uh, we've talked about them recently. Uh, Soto's brother is uh, in, the, in the pipeline of the Washington Nationals. Now Brian Acuna is officially in the pipeline of the Minnesota Twins, 16-year-old. So that means he's going to be in the majors probably in the next three years. Uh if he's anything like his brother, that's going to be crazy to see. But, hey, let's move on to other news. Speed round today. Uh, do you guys remember Brock Holt uh, last August 7th, Texas, Oakland? He threw the 31-mile-per-hour pitch. I, I still think it's kind of funny to look back on that because he offered his glove and hat to the umpires on the way out. Uh, you know, like, hey, you know. Oh, here you go. You want to check my glove? You want to check? You know, I'm throwing 31 miles per hour. You want to check my spin rate on that? Uh, Brock Brock Holt, he's a hero. I thought that was awesome, but it leads me into talking about what the heck is going on with all the balls that pulled out of the game. We've talked about this each week. Uh, Trevor Bauer had a ball taken out, and obviously they're waiting for the CBA to be finished, and then they're going to announce their punishments. Um, some players, and again, it's weird because some players were announced right away. Hey suspension you know he's got sus, sus substance on the ball but then you know guys like trevor bauer and some other pitchers there's still other trevor's not the only one there's some other people out there that have not had their announcement on their balls taken out and that sounds weird to say it but yeah you're going to take your balls out during the game you're going to get some people to raise their eyebrows you know what i'm saying you know what i'm saying but it's just interesting again this is many of the things i talk about how major league baseball takes 10 steps forward one step back 
uh, which will lead us into our Hall of Fame talk, but not right now. But that's pretty much the buzz around town is the Hall of Fame is just, man, it's becoming crap, total crap. But in other news, uh, Mike Slope signs with the Padres. Yeah, the former St. Louis head, St. Louis Cardinals uh, skipper. Remember when he was fired last year? It was really odd, and I, we've talked about that on the podcast. It's very hard to find any information what he did wrong. Um, it just came down to in differences between him and the owner, from what I can gather. Then he gets a little little job for a little while this year with the commissioner. And now his next stop is San Diego Padres, part-time consultant for player development. Uh, again, the Padres making moves. Free agency is still cooking. They can still add some chips on the table, but... You know, they went and got a head coach. Now they added Mike for player development, who obviously was very successful in St. Louis. Padres see that success. So, I mean, so far, Padres are doing good. You know, Mets, there's a lot of teams doing really good, and you have to have your, you know, tip your cap to the L.A. Angels for their pitching. I've been giving the Angels a hard time because of how much money they spend on players and how they don't get anywhere. But, you know, they, like I told you last podcast, they've drafted 20 pitchers with 20 picks in the 2021 draft. Uh, they're signing Iglesias, Noah, uh, seven international players, and, or international pitchers, excuse me. And, you know, it's funny. I love eating crow. I love, uh, you know, I've been giving the Angels a hard time for the last 12 months, pretty or the last couple of years. But the Angels it went out and inked a surprise former quality big league pitcher to a minor league deal, uh, Daniel Ponce de Leon. Yeah, only about, what, four or five years in the majors, Angels signed him. So if he can get, you know, his first two years were pretty good. Uh, Not a bad pitcher. If he can, you know, get up there and throw some innings, that's just another arm they could bring up down the line. And it's, you know, oftentimes teams will sign guys like this and then nothing comes of it because of injuries or whatever reason that's holding this player back. But... This is also one of those chips that, hey, if this works out, this bolsters your pitching rotation. You maybe could bring him up midseason to, down the stretch, or maybe he's going to be able to make it back into the majors and be a starter again. But, you know, as much as I was giving the Angels a hard time, I have to give them a really good effort in the offseason. They've done a lot, and they're addressing the main issue, which is their pitching. Their pitching was a huge issue. So, again, hats off to the Angels doing it right now and if you're an angel fan you're finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel but you know i don't know i don't know the reason why i say i don't know is this leads me into let's talk fantasy talk real quick fantasy talk and i want to talk about mike trout because again this ties into la angels they're doing all types of moves they even have mike trout recently recruiting trying to get people to come over which is just weird but the whole Fantasy talk. You know, when you do your fantasy baseball, years past, you get Mike Trout, you get Jacob DeGrom, guys like that. You're like, you know what I'm talking about. If you guys have done fantasy before, whoever gets Mike Trout on their fantasy for the year, you know the guy is talking trash all year long. And he's very happy. He's got a consistent guy that's always going to be in there putting up good numbers. And it's Mike Trout. We all know about Mike Trout. He's the biggest stud in baseball. But you know what I'm talking about. You always got that friend who just, and then you know they inevitably, inevitably show up in a Mike Trout jersey just to make it worse. So it's almost some of these fancy baseball clubs. They have like a Mike Trout jersey. Whoever wins Mike Trout gets to wear the jersey each year. But again, it's Mike Trout's mystery is frustrating. I searched today before I started the podcast. Any batting practice? There's no batting practice going on with Mike Trout. Now Ronald Acuna Jr. Yeah. I've been posting stuff on IG on our Baseball News Club IG account. Acuna playing ball. He's, I mean, hitting the ball. But you're not seeing Mike Trout in the batting cage. But according to Mike Trout, back in November, he said that, hey, I'm I'm on track to be ready for spring training. Spring training? We've talked about this, guys. What the hell's going on with Mike Trout? I'm on track, so it's not even 100% that he's back. And again, you don't see him in the cages. You don't even see him swinging. And Acuna went through that. You saw that injury that Acuna had last year. That was horrible, man. Horrible injury. And he's back swinging. He's going to be playing for the Braves this year. But something's going on with Mike Trout. So, again, as a fantasy baseball player, 
do you take Mike Trout this year? And now a lot of you are going to be immediately jumping on the train going, oh, hell yeah, what are you, high man? You know what you're talking about. You know, what, did, what did you just crawl underneath the rock? Of course you're going to take Mike Trout, man. Hey, what is going on with Mike Trout? I'm not saying he, I love Mike Trout, but the reality is, is we don't know what's going on with Mike Trout. We don't know if, dude, he's slated for spring training. What happened to him slated to two weeks when he first got his, what, level two calf strain? And then it was like, oh, he's going to play after the All-Star break? And then all of a sudden, nothing? It's been like that. It's been frustrating for the Angels fans. What the hell's going on with Mike Trout? So again, as a fantasy person, your first instinct is, yeah, I'm taking him. But what about if he doesn't play? And he's going to be back to Mike Trout. I mean, in our head, it's like Clayton Kershaw. You think you can't imagine that guy in any other uniform but Dodger Blue. It's like Mike Trout. You're like, you cannot think of Mike Trout being on the field and not being the most awesome player in baseball but this injury is really sidelined him this is a real scratcher if you're a fantasy guy do you take Mike Trout and do you take Jacob DeGrom don't get me wrong I love Jacob DeGrom but he had injuries but here's the thing Jacob no longer is carrying the entire team on his back Cone went out there and put bread on the butter and spread it out and now there's pitching there's They've got a good team. Jacob is not going to have to be utilized like he has been in last year's past. Maybe get him 20 to 25. I don't know how healthy he is, but that's something that is key to the Mets' victory this season. It was key to their uh, stretch run last year when they didn't have Jacob. And again, if you're a fantasy guy, do you take Jacob to Grom? Is he pitching this year? All, all signs that I've read is he is going to be pitching. He is back healthy. But again, this is a... This is one of those things as a fantasy baseball player, you're like, man, you can't, your impulse is, is yeah, I'm going to take these guys on my team, but in the back of your head, you're just like, shit, 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 shit. I hope this isn't a bad move. I shit, 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 shit. I hope this isn't a bad move. And another person we would talk about, and again, this is, LA Angels are going to be one of the most fascinating teams to watch this year. And that division is going to be a fascinating, fun division to watch. But Angels are stepping it up. They're going to be a better team this year. I mean, come on. Uh, the rest of the team can't stink that bad forever. And Pujols is out of there. And we're going to talk a little bit when good players leave next. Just like Pujols. But Shane Bieber. Do you put him on your fantasy? I think so. I mean, the former 2020 Triple Crown and AL Cy Young winner. Had a bump shoulder back in June. Uh, didn't play that much in 2021. But... Look at his prior seasons. I mean, dude, 2020 was sick. And I think we all know about every game was like a freaking record or something that Shane Bieber did that season. He was a god. I mean, no, Trevor Bauer is on a whole different level. So is this cat, man. What a year. And he's still relatively young. Um, bum shoulder, that can mean a lot of things. But here's something that was interesting. Sometimes when a pitcher has a bum shoulder or when they're going through threes, they alter their pitching. They alter their pitches because they're, you know, certain pitches might put too much strain on the arm or on the body and they kind of adjust things. So it's kind of hard to tell on the stats I'm about to give you is, is just these stats, his early season way of pitching, then he adjusts down the stretch. Um, I didn't dig that deep. Maybe you can tell me in the comments, but last year, his cutter, he abandoned his cutter. Uh, he did 16.2% his Cy Young year, and he dropped it down to 3.2. So he really abandoned his cutter, but I'm not sure if that's creating strain on his arm doing the fastball and the cutter. Uh, you know, just, I don't know. And despite the cutter having a better spin rate and whiff percentage in 2021, he still didn't use it that much. I mean, 16.2 to 3.2 is a huge drop. Now his slider in 2020 was 11.6. And it jumped in 2021 to 25%, 25.5. That's a hell of a jump. That's a big jump. But his whiff percentage is way better with his slider. And his slider spin rate has jumped a lot from 2020 to 2021. So again, is it a question of he was just going to play around the slider a little bit early on the season and then close out the second half with his cutter? Pitchers do that all the time. Roger Clemens was famous for doing stuff like that. That's how you keep people on your toes. You don't use the same pitches throughout the year, but his Cy Young season was totally different. 
in that respect to his 2021 when it comes to his cutter and his slider. So as a fantasy uh, player, I would, you know, do you, if you had a choice between date Jacob DeGrom and Shane Bieber on your fantasy team, who do you take? Now, again, your impulse would be like, Shit, yeah, take, well, that one's a tough one too because they're both studs. But of course, Jacob DeGrom, you're going to be like, yeah, I'll take Jacob. But is he 100% this year? Shane Bieber, I think, is a little bit more on the ball to be playing than Jacob DeGrom, but I don't know. Because they're, you know, during lockout, everything's hush, hush, hush. But that, again, we'll go into hush, hush, hush here in a little bit. But who do you take? Seriously, do you take Mike Trapp? Do you take Jacob DeGrom? Do you take Ronald Acuna? I think Ronald Acuna is a better pick than Mike Trout, to be honest with you guys. And I hate to say that. Those words coming out of my mouth, I just want to slap myself in the lips. I want to smack myself. I'm talking crazy talk. But if you look at it, Mike Trout is an unknown. Acuna is at least showing up on social media in the batting cage, hitting the tar out of the ball. I'm leaning towards Acuna. I love Mike Trout, and it could burn you, but God damn it, I'm so pissed at the Angels and what they're doing with him. And this injury right now, they're using him. I think they're just using him to recruit people. Obviously, he's they're literally and figuratively using him. But I'm just saying, what is going on with Mike Trout? Who do you take? Now, when good players leave, Drew, Bled, Drew Bledslow. <laughs> Bledsoe. Drew Bledslow. I'm not a football guy. He, remember, Tom Brady took over and the rest is history. Well, there's a bunch of examples I can give you, but I just want to paint a couple more. Washington Nationals. Bryce Harper leaves. They win the World Series. Last year, no Acuna or Marcel. Look what Atlanta did. All I'm saying is Mike Trout. If he is not playing, you saw what happened with the Shohei taking over the team. But let's say Mike doesn't play the first half and the Angels just blow it up. Is it just one of those situations where... When good players leave, just the team plays different. And it does happen from time to time. I've seen it from time to time. Sometimes good players, you'll see teams play better without their star player. And I don't know if that's something that's enduring. or Obviously, you know, it, endurance is a big thing. Can you do that all year long? But here's the thing. And I know fans... Uh, Angel fans hate hate hearing this and Trout fans hate hearing this, but Mike Trout is not the face of the Angels. And that's not me. This is a survey. I've already talked about this survey. There's a survey on uh, social media asking every every state there was a survey who the favorite player is. And Shohei showed up like chicken pox, man, all over the United States. Uh, Trout, no. So I'm just, baseball is brutal. And can change in a blink of an eye. And uh, I'm not saying Mike Trout is out, but I'm just, my eyes on him right now, I have never paid more attention to Mike Trout's situation in the LA Angels than I've ever had in my life. I'm not a, but the Angels are an extremely interesting case study right now in baseball and their front office and how they do things. Look at the Tampa Bay Rays, their front office. Look at the Padres' front office, the Dodgers, um, Atlanta's front office. You know, you just look at these front offices and how they do things. It just makes you think, what is the hell's happened with Mike Trout? It's no longer a slam dunk. It really isn't. And speaking of slam dunks, moving on to other news. Hey, like that segue. Adam Wainwright dunks on Major League lockout rule. Major League Baseball not allowing Jason Ingringhausen to attend Adam Wainwright's charity event. Uh, Major League Baseball during the lockout prohibits events. So COVID, because of COVID, that's what Major League Baseball is saying. Now this to me, and I think I'm right there with Adam Wainwright. Adam Wainwright spit back a little venom. Nothing over the top. He doesn't really do anything over the top, but it just pisses me off. You know why? Here's why. I'll tell you exactly why. I guarantee there's some owners out there that are throwing big parties at their home. I guarantee there's some owners going out to clubs somewhere in the world. I guarantee, you know, see what I'm saying? There's a hypocritical theme going on where you're like, oh, okay, so this, because he's a player, he's under contract. I get it. 
But give me a break, man. Give me a break. Let him play, man. Let him play. Oh, man. So we went over the CBA. Just trying to think about what else we can go on before we get to the Hall of Fame. I guess we might as well dive into the Baseball Hall of Fame. David Ortiz was elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, David got 307 votes, which is 77.9. Barry Bonds got 260 votes, which was 66%. Roger Clemens got 65. Scott Rowland, 63%. Kurt Schilling, 58. He dropped. Todd Helton, 52. So on and so forth. And Jeff Kent, 32. A-Rod, his first time around, 34%. Uh, Sammy, there's some exited. Or there's some people exiting. Sammy Sosa, 18%. His final year on ballot. Sad. Kurt Schilling, final, final year on ballot. Roger Clemens, final year on ballot. Barry Bonds, final year on ballot. Very sad. And then players dropping off because they receive less than 5% will drop off future ballots. Tim Linscombe, Ryan Howard, Justin Morneau. Papelbon, Prince Fielder, Joe Nathan. I mean, some pretty heavy, heavy names on there. But this class is different in a lot of different ways. We've talked for many times about the baseball writers and the problems in, with the baseball writing. Now, the PED thing is the forefront of the conversation with the Hall of Fame. The fact that David Ortiz got in and the fact he got in the first ballot, I think, shocked a lot of people. But again, I was been talking to you guys about this for the longest time. That is this a changing of the tides? Are we now looking at accepting PED related players? Obviously, yes. And you know what? It's not about if I'm OK with it or not. I'm looking at the big picture, the dirty tasting water test. Obviously, Bonds and Clemens, their ties to Balco and Mitchell Report, respectively. But there was a survey test in 2003, which is the year before MLB started testing, which is 2004. David Ortiz was mentioned with Bonds, etc. Now, again, this is this report, and there's still a lot of names that are now been released. And in fact, there's players from that report that are probably in the Hall of Fame. This is the conundrum. This is the issue. This is the problem with the baseball writers. There's, and you know what I'm, what I love to see is a lot of the biggest, uh, best sports names out there, and uh, like media personalities are on board the same view I have that this needs to be fixed. There's so, you can't you just dipped your feet in the water of the forbidden pool so to speak. You allowed a guy in the Hall of Fame with PED related tag to his career. Now, I'm not going to sit there and split hairs about oh well, we didn't find this out this out. Let's go back to when it happened. Cuz for one, if you're like 16 right now, come on, man. This happened in 2003. You know, it's it's hard to talk to people that if you weren't there, then just absorb and listen. Because if you weren't even alive and don't act like you were into baseball at five years old, this happened way back in 2003, people. So when this happened, it was bad news. Ortiz was mentioned in the same name with Bonds. Now, we don't know what he tested for. And MLB did admit it could, you know, these testings, not Ortiz, but the testings could be triggered by over-the-counter supplements. There was two different times tested. One was random, and then one was seven days later. We don't know which test David Ortiz failed. The random one, or the seven days later, or whatever. Now, Rob Manfred in 2013 revealed not 100% of the tests were true positives. So after 2003, for the next... You know, uh, for David Ortiz from 2003, his next four years at, after that were his best career numbers ever. I mean, oh my God. And his power numbers were nuts. 
but there's so many layers to this onion donkey and what we're talking about is now when it came out again if you were alive i'm 50 so i remember this stuff so if you're even 25 right now it's kind of you're kind of you know even if you're you know what i'm saying i'm not trying to weed anybody out but how do you really know what went on other than what you've read online you weren't even alive then you weren't going through the experience of the news every night all the conversations all the interviews you it's hard to crystallize or to take years of conversations and put it into a Wikipedia paragraph. Because all I'm saying is for those of you that weren't even part of baseball then and knew what was going on and understood the big picture, take it with a grain of salt. Because when the announcements came out, it's like today. If there was an announcement today by the commissioner of baseball, Rob Manfred, that 2020 there was uh, a survey test and they found out that Bryce Harper, uh-oh, Miguel Cabrera, uh-oh, tested positive for the survey, but if Major League Baseball said, hey, we don't know what could have triggered Bryce Harper or Miguel Cabrera, could have been over counter, there's two different tests, one was random, we don't know, and these tests, not all of them were true positives, because they never came out and said that Bryce tested positive or Miguel Cabrera, they just said, hey, we did a survey test. But next year, we're going to start doing the PD test. Once we start doing the PD test, then we'll know. And once they started doing it, David Ortiz was fine. But all I'm saying is if it presented to you in that context, I'm just trying to help those out that are, you know, weren't around when this happened in 2003 or you're too young to remember or comprehend it. That's kind of the example. How would you feel against Bryce or Miguel? Would you be like, nah, they don't get in the Hall of Fame because they're related. But what about if Bryce comes out and says, hey, I was taking some supplements, but there was nothing PED related. I'm totally clean. I test all the time with Major League Baseball. I've never felt anything. So you're like, oh, okay. And, and since Major League Baseball doesn't provide any proof, do you allow that to stain your judgment for the player to be allowed into Hall of Fame? That's what kind of conversation we're having right now with David Ortiz. David came out right after, of course, and said, oh, well, yeah, I was, you know, it wasn't PEDs. I had some, you know, probably some supplements. I was taking supplements. I didn't, I passed all my tests. And since Major League Baseball hasn't revealed what it is, and David came out, and what David did better than like A-Rod and other players, uh, granted A-Rod got busted a lot more, but is what he did afterwards he just kind of dismissed, said, hey, this is what it is. I'm moving on. He didn't allow himself to get pulled down the rabbit hole in conversations and tied into Sammy Sosa and, and uh, you know, all the other guys. He separated himself from them, and he just left it at that. And I think the fans, based on the information given by MLB and what Rob Manfred said in 2013, I think they're kind of believing David is okay. And obviously the baseball writers believe that now. But the thing is, is you're still, we don't know the truth. The truth could be he was on PEDs because if you look at his career, after 2003, his next four years were his best of his career and the power numbers were freaking bonkers. But here's the thing. And I, I've been listening to a lot of chatter out there. You know I always listen to the pulse of all the conversations of all the sports figures, editors, and uh, other social medias and when i was okay for one we didn't have a freaking problem with it when it was happening okay when brady anderson the baltimore's was hitting the crap out of the ball out of nowhere and jose batista started hitting the crap out of the ball we were fine with it everybody knew there was something wrong and i'm going to get back into that in a second but here's something to chew on bud Seelig's in the hall of fame he was the commissioner during this era when everyone was juicing, when Bonds was juicing, when Clemens was juicing, when everybody was so many people. And Major League Baseball did the survey in 2003 and they've said it. They just wanted to get an idea like what the level was of usage or in other words, how freaking bad is it? How out of control is it? And then that's where they decided, hey, depending on how bad the survey is, then we'll implement P 
PED testing in 2004, or we won't. Well, guess what they ended up doing? They started implementing because it was so bad. So for all we know, David did test positive. But again, we don't know. Do you lean on the fact that you believe David? I, I think I think so. David was a great player. Fantastic player. But, I mean, there's a lot of people off. They're no longer going to be part of the Hall of Fame. There's a lot of good names that are no longer, no longer going to be there. But we got new names now. I mean, hey, we got Jimmy Rollins. You got 9%, but he's first time on the ballot. A-Rod. A-Rod's going to be, again, an interesting case study. It's funny how we lose Bonds and Clemens PD-related guys, but now we get them replaced with A-Rod. We still got Gary Sheffield on there that's in his eighth year. Kurt's gone. Clemens, Bonds, they're gone. Sosa's gone. You know, the guys that are associated with that era. But then you got some guys like, you know, like I said, Bobby Abreu, Mark Burley, Torrey Hunter, they've been going downhill. Todd Hel Helton's been on there four years. Scott Rowland is fifth. I mean, I thought Scott was in, but Scott Rowland's looking good, man. 63%. Good chance he's getting in next year. Same with Todd. And then there's always the talk of Andrew Jones. I don't think he has necessarily the Hall of Fame numbers. I mean, 1,900 hits, but one of the greatest outfielders, so a lot of gold gloves. He's going to get in. Manny Ramirez is on his sixth. So it's going to be... Guys like Manny we're going to be talking about in A-Rod moving forward. But again, let's get back to what I'm talking about. Bud Selig's in the Hall of Fame. Now, the Hall of Fame, there is a board that governs the Hall of Fame. So what's very interesting is if you go to the Hall of Fame today, you think that if you go there that, hey, I'm going to go in the Hall of Fame and see that nobody in there is PD related. I'm going to walk in there and I'm going to see the greats. Joe DiMaggio, Babe Ruth, Sandy Koufax. Ah, you want to talk about drugs? Well, I'll hold that story later with Sandy Koufax. Yeah. But I'm just saying, when you go to the Hall of Fame, that's what you think. I'm coming into the cleanest Hall of Fame universe. If you think nobody took PEDs during that time, you're high. You're you weren't. You're just in denial. Everybody, 2003, 2004 is bad, and you look at everything that went on. But when you go to the Hall of Fame, Sosa has a ton of stuff in there: balls, gloves, bats, but no plaque. How do you make that distinction? Bonds and Clemens. Bonds has a boatload of stuff there. All dude, his record breaking home runs. Hey, there's so much stuff with Barry Bonds in there, but no plaque. Again, how do you make that distinction? Now you allowed in David Ortiz, Bonds, and Clemens, and Sosa have more stuff there in the Hall of Fame than David Ortiz, who now has a plaque. This is what this is what the baseball writers have ruined the Hall of Fame. It's just you're not thinking it through. Bonds and Clemens are Hall of Famers. Sosa. And I agree with some of the my other baseball or sports announcers out there calling for an alteration to the process of the Hall of Fame. If these players play during the PD era, say, yeah, put on their plaque. Great player. This many hits. This many home runs. One's World Series. Great player. Played in the PED era. Bonds is a Hall of Famer, folks. And here's the thing. And this is the people that I'm talking to directly. And that you weren't there, you don't know. Everybody knew there was something wrong. But nobody did anything about it. Every ESPN announcer. Bob Costas. Peter Gammons. All your little favorite players. Oh, your little, you know, every... Team, every player, you, every fan, you knew it. Freaking Brett Boone was hitting moonshots the right center. The dude is what? F small dude. 
Brady Anderson was hitting the crap. Everyone was all of a sudden having these seasons where you're like, but the thing is, is when McGuire started his run at Roger Maris, it was a whole different chapter. You knew something was, everyone knew, again, you're looking at a guy, Mark McGuire, to hit 49 home runs his rookie year. So the guy obviously has power, but it's different because everyone knew this was coming. You knew the prior season, because there was already talk about him breaking Roger Maris's record. Now, keep in mind, when Roger Maris broke Babe Ruth's record, it wasn't easy. Just like it wasn't easy for Bonds and Sosa, the stress, the fame. Roger Maris was pulling his hair out of his head because the Yankees fans were such jerks to him. The Yankee fans, and this is something I don't think is just a dark period in Yankee history. The dude, because he was getting ready to break one of the most coveted records in sports history and pass Babe Ruth, who's their golden boy, the dude went through a lot of stress, threats on his life. Yeah, Roger Maris had a rough time. Now, that was in six. So you went from 27, 1927 to 61. Then you go from 1961 to when Bonds, I mean, to when uh, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa ran for it in the early 2000s to where Bonds broke it. Now, the theme was, is everybody knew something was different. And you cannot tell me the Bud Selig, who has a plaque in the Hall of Fame, deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. You see the contradiction? You're the commissioner. You knew this was going on. You get in the Hall of Fame, but the players that were making the sport popular again, the players that you ruled over, don't get in. This is the con- This is the problem with the Hall of Fame. And people are going, well, they're related to PEDs, and the Mitchell Report for Clemens and Balco for Bonds. I get what you're saying, but these are great Major League ball players. Bonds, when he was skinny, was still one of the greatest players in the game, if not the greatest players, still winning MVPs. These guys, I think, just wanted to hold on to their high level of performance and started doing the stuff towards the end of their career. That's my full on belief, but you cannot tell me, listen, they had chicks dig the long bar commercials, the Maris chase. It was everywhere. It was super crazy popular. McGuire's son was helping out as a bat boy. I mean, look at that. It was a whole different atmosphere in baseball. Baseball was back. Everybody loved it. Nobody said shit about it. Until they get ready for the Hall of Fame. So again, this is where I go back where my disgruntled perspective against baseball writers. You rode that wave, you son of a bitches. You rode that wave and it got you to where you're at. Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa gave you the career some of you have today. And you're going to vote them out. So there's problems. The solution, and I heard this from different people and I agree with it. Put them in, put in bonds, put in Clemens, just alter their plaque to where it says something to the effect at the bottom. This is a player that played during the PD era. So you're not accusing them, but they're getting in. Barry Bonds is one of the greatest players ever to swing a bat, ever to step or put cleats on and step onto a field. Whether you like him or not, the dude could swing. Do yourself a favor. Go online. And go watch Barry Bonds, his, like his last couple of years, his swing. His swing was so defined, so just, mm, it's like a good a good bottle of wine, man. It, he just aged into such a, that, he was a skinny guy for Pittsburgh for a long time. But when he bulked up, it almost made sense. You know what I'm saying? Like when you look at his swing, you're like, that swing couldn't be that efficient if he was skinnier. But just having the right amount of muscle I just, that's just a beautiful goddamn swing. And the thing that impresses me is if you watch his timing mechanism, I mean, the ball's almost half, more than halfway to home plate before you see the guy moving and adjusting. So it's just, again, all of us, everyone in Major League Baseball is taking PEDs, but only a certain few players are good enough to take it to that next level. So you're going to hate on those players, but not on the other players or whatever, vice versa. It just doesn't make sense. We have to figure out a way. And, you know, I think ultimately a couple things moving forward, we're going to have to question the credibility of writers moving forward. And we're going to have to change the title on the plaque. That's the only way we're going to solve the situation, guys. Because with David Ortiz in there now, we don't know the full truth. 
we don't know what's real. We really don't. I want to see Bonds in there. I want to see Clemens in there. Schilling, I think he has the numbers. Sosa, they have the numbers, man. Put them in, give them a plaque, but just put something on, create a little wing for the PED era. But there's nothing worse if you're a player and you, you know, you've got all their bats, their balls, their uniforms, the date they broke these records. So the Hall of Fame's filled with their stuff, but we're not going to give them a plaque. Now, I know there's people out there going, PED era, this is, you know, no one should get in. Someone just did. David Ortiz just got in. And there are others that are already in there that took PEDs that we don't know about. I guarantee that's happened. I mean, would you guys crap yourself if you found out that Cal Ripken was taking PEDs to keep himself healthy so he can keep that Lou Gehrig streak going? How'd you feel about that? Or what about if you heard like Wade Boggs had to take a, a PEDs because of a certain injury just for six months of his career? But look at his whole body of work without it. You see what I'm saying? That's where the baseball writers have put us on a slippery slope. And you're just going to dangle that carrot out there. And it's just like having a bunch of drunk friends driving backwards in a car. It's bound to crash. It's just a tragedy going to happen. This is the road we're going down with Major League Baseball Hall of Fame voting. It's turned to crap. It's been a joke for years. We got guys that aren't submitting their votes because they don't believe anyone's a Hall of Famer. You don't know baseball if you look at the guys that are on the list, there's so many Hall of Famers, man. I'm looking forward to Scott Rowland getting in. I am guarantee right now Scott Rowland's getting in next year. But we just lost. Now it's up to the Veterans Committee to get Bonds in and get Clemens. That's going to take some time. It's years down the road now. It's just a shame. Uh, baseball writers, you screwed up the sport. You screwed it up. Let's move on to one other theme with the CBA. Not sure if you guys knew about this, but uh, players get moving allowances. So if they're assigned by a club to another major league club, uh, there is allowances for moving. A sum of 1,200 if the distance between the home ballpark of the signer and assignee clubs is 1,000 miles or less. And a sum of 1,750 if the distance between the home ballparks of the, of the player and the owner or the club is greater than 1,000 air miles and up to 2,000 air miles. So on and so forth. It goes up to 2,200. So the players get allowances. They get spring training allowances, but they also get moving allowances. But it doesn't seem like that's a lot of money, 1,200 for a player to be moving. I mean, I've moved before. And it's I've used those pods. Shit's expensive, man. It's just expensive. But anyhow, uh, this week's podcast, we're going to get it wrapped up. I know we don't got a ton going for you today. We got about an hour, but I just want to thank you guys again for listening to us. Uh, uh, thank you for the patience. We're not doing the video just yet. Um, I'm still trying to figure, I might have to switch my software. I'm just not getting my video to match with my audio when I move it on over to my editing. So we're going to be bringing you video. We appreciate your support. Thanks for listening to the Baseball News Club and Ball and Play. Have a great day. Says my signing out.